Hey guys, welcome to the video where today we'll talk about enzyme inhibition. And if you guys haven't already, go ahead and check out some of the other videos that I have out talking about proteins and enzymes. I think it's very important to watch those videos before coming to this video, just so you can get a brief understanding of enzymes. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Um, a wise man once told me that enzymes are very important in chemical reactions. And that wise man was right because enzymes lower the activation energy of chemical reactions and thus speeding the rate of reactions. So they're very important in a lot of bio, uh, biological uh, reactions that we come across. Um, here we have a whole bunch of numbers, letters, and a whole bunch of confusing stuff that no one cares about, right? I want to kind of simplify this. So what we have is the E and the S, right? E plus S. E is the enzyme and S is the substrate. So when you have these two together, you form something called an enzyme substrate complex, right? And then from there, what we have formed is the enzyme by itself and the ultimate goal of every reaction, of every reaction is to form that product. Right. So again, we have E and S enzyme and substrate give you the enzyme substrate complex, thus forming a product in the end and the enzyme leaving. Right. E plus P. This is called uh, this is when they dissociate is what it's called. But we don't want to be too fancy. Right. <laughs> now, if we go into the K's, right, uh, for the K's, we have K1 and K1. If we look down here just means the forward reaction, right? That enzyme and substrate going to the enzyme substrate complex. Then we have K minus one, which is the reversible reaction because this reaction can be reversible. So when we reach this enzyme substrate, it doesn't necessarily always have to create that product. Sometimes it'll go right back to the enzyme and substrate. So it can either go forward to make products and sometimes it doesn't. This is like this is an intermediate step here. It doesn't always have to form that product, though that's the goal. It doesn't always happen. Then K2 is the forward reaction rate, which can be seen right here. And this is irreversible. The K2, this is where we create the product and the enzyme. They dissociate, they come apart, and the product is formed. And down below, we have KM and VMAX, which I don't want to get too much into this video. I would rather get into it with another video. Uh, and that's when we talk about more equations and more math that everyone hates in graphs. KM is the concentration of enzyme binding to substrate. And then the VMAX is the maximum rate when the enzyme is fully saturated by substrate. And I'm going to bring this back up in the next videos that uh, come ahead. So I just want to give like a textbook definition for you guys there. And I just want to go into some of the different types of inhibitors. So let's get right to it. Actually, I actually have one more slot that I need to talk about here, which I forgot. If anyone's having trouble with enzyme substrate, the whole idea and the, the whole thing here. Uh, this is one thing that my college professor actually told us about. Um, he shared with us. And, you know, he's a very smart guy, so I trust him. Um, he represents enzymes as his brother. However, for me, I say my greedy brother, right? The substrate we represent as apples. Because remember, we have this enzyme and substrate. They come together. So I like to think of the enzyme as Pac-Man or my brother. And then the substrate as apples, as seen here. They come together, and this is represented as the enzyme substrate complex. He eats the apple, then my brother leaves, and then we have a product, whatever's left of that apple, right? So again, the enzyme is my greedy brother, right? Then the substrate is the apples. My brother eats the apples, they're together. Brother and apple is the ES, enzyme substrate complex. And then in the end, my brother's like, all right, I'm doing the apple. And then the product is whatever is left over from the apple, that's what's produced, right? Or he makes something else out of that apple. So that's just a quick little, you know, um, scenario or kind of things that you guys can remember maybe. Um, remembering by enzyme substrate, enzyme substrate product is fine. But if you kind of want to conceptualize things and make 
uh, references or ideas. That's always fine. I always found that very helpful in uh, my undergrad. So next, I want to go into competitive inhibition, right? Which is actually seen in a lot of reactions, uh, a lot of inhibition. Uh, I will actually give an example. You guys already see it down below. If you guys can guess what it is, because I'm going to erase it, you guys can all get cookies. But in competitive inhibition, what we have is something called an inhibitor. So let me just go ahead and draw that out and I'll draw it in a different color. You have something called an inhibitor. And the triangle in red represents our substrate, right? So let me actually uh, label all these. Uh, and if you guys want, you guys can label it as I'm labeling it to kind of practice. So what do we have here? We have my brother or the enzyme, right? We like to call it. Then I already drew it out, but I'll erase it and do it again just for you guys because I love you guys so much. Then we have the apples, which is the substrate, right? Then we have my brother eating the apples. Me and my brother, I'm, not me and my brother, my brother and the apples are together and they form the ES, the enzyme substrate complex. Then after that, my brother's done with the apple. So he's by himself. He's just the enzyme. And then what we have next is just the product. See, I was about to draw a substrate there. You guys caught me. Product. He's done with the apple. The apple turns into something else or whatever. That's the product. So back to the inhibitor. If you guys notice, the inhibitor has somewhat of a sim similar structure to the substrate. So in competitive inhibition, we have the inhibitor and we have the substrate fighting for this. This is called the active site, this gap area in the, the Pac-Man guy we have here, right? That is called the active site. So this again, the substrate and inhibitor are fighting for that active site, right? And how is this inhibitor able to bind to this enzyme? Well, sometimes what happens is the inhibitor has a very high affinity for that enzyme or they just like to be together. It's like, wow, I really like this inhibitor. I'd rather be with that guy. Or the enzyme has more affinity for the inhibitor or the inhibitor has more affinity for the enzyme. It's vice versa either way. So let me draw my arrows here because what we can have is another reversible reaction where we have the enzyme binded to the inhibitor, right? That's uh, represented as this black triangle. And what happens to the substrate? Well, the substrate doesn't bind. The substrate will just be here in red, the red triangle. And just continue to shade that in. And it just would not bind, right? So what happens here? When this happens, the, um, the inhibitor makes the enzyme substrate concentration go down. That's what inhibitors do. So for us to get that concentration back up, all we'd have to do is increase the amount of substrate we have, right? If we increase the amount of substrate, then we'll have more enzyme substrate uh, complexes available, right? Uh, I actually want to get into ex an example now of a competitive inhibitor. So let me just leave that for you guys there. And what I want to do is kind of pull up some photos. An example of a competitive inhibitor is penicillin, right? It's actually something called an irreversible inhibitor, right? It binds very tight to the end to the enzyme. So with some background history of penicillin, um, we know that penicillin is an antiviral drug, antibacterial, but what does it really do? Again, we say it's a competitive inhibitor. So penicillin, what it does is it's an enzyme inhibitor for bacterial cells. It binds to the special enzymes in bacteria that are responsible for producing its cell wall. So if I can pull up a photo here, let's see. We have a bacterial cell, right? And it has a cell wall. We know that the cell wall is vital for bacteria, you know, to hold all the organelles. Well, not organelles, I'm sorry. 
That's so bad. <laughs> to hold its structure, right? Now, if there is no cell wall, there will be no structure and the bacteria, bacterial cell dies. So what penicillin does is it acts as an inhibitor to an enzyme called transpeptidase, right? And I don't want to get too much into the reaction, but what we see here is we have penicillin plus transpeptidase, right? I keep pulling my marker. Plus transpeptidase gives you this here, this large structure. And we see down here it says inactivated. That enzyme cannot make the cell wall for that bacterial cell, so it ceases function. It's not able to create that bacterial cell, thus killing the bacteria. So this is just an example of competitive inhibition in kind of like the real world setting as to me just telling you this is what it is, right? Because I really like to keep real world, real life concepts into things, right? So it's it's kind of a better understanding. That's a perfect example of um, competitive inhibition. So now if we go into the next one, what we have is something called, let's see, if we swipe over, I think it's, I have it as non-competitive coming next. Yes, non-competitive inhibition. And in non-competitive inhibition, what we have is still we have, again, we have the enzyme, we have the substrate, we have the enzyme substrate complex, enzyme, and then our product, right? However, this is where it becomes different. If I get my eraser here and I draw this, this is non-competitive because now the inhibitor is not going for the active site. It's going for another little area called the allosteric site, right? So we have the inhibitor here. It goes to the allosteric site. So it's not competing for the active site, which is right here with the substrate. It's going to its own little home, again, called the allosteric site, right? So now if we draw some arrows, we can see that we get this. Oh, no, that was a terrible pack, man. <laughs> we'll get something like this, where the inhibitor is right binded to the allosteric site. And then we have our substrate still. And what can happen here is that substrate can still bind to this active site. And so we get this here. Uh, let's see, Pac-Man, Pac-Man, Pac-Man. You guys need to give me a reward for all this drawing, you know? So the red represents the substrate, and then the black represents the inhibitor that binds to the allosteric site, right? But what happens here? We form no product though, which sucks, right? No product is formed. Now, the only way more product can be formed is if the inhibitor is released. So we see a lot of arrows here, double arrows, meaning they're all irreversible. Anything can happen. So in non-competitive inhibition, we have inhibitor and substrate. They do not go for, well, the inhibitor does not go for the active site. It actually goes for the allosteric site, hence why it's non-competitive. However, in competitive inhibition, where is it at? In competitive inhibition, they are fighting for that active site, right, which is right here. So those are the main differences between non-competitive and competitive. So let's go to the last one that we want to talk about. Last one we want to talk about is called uncompetitive inhibition. And the easiest way to remember this one is very simple. The allosteric site is open after the substrate binds, right? So what happens here is if I redraw it, actually, I'm going to erase this. You guys got it? You guys got it? Okay, perfect. <laughs> if you guys want, just, um, you know, rewind back. Do people say rewind still? Whatever. You guys can press that button, I think. <laughs> so in uncompetitive inhibition, I want to start it right here, right? I want to start it right here because this, this part is... Uh, this part is not where the action happens. The action happens right here, right? 
So again, now that substrate is binded to the enzyme substrate. Now what happens is if we erase right here, then that's when the inhibitor comes in and attaches. So again, the inhibitor binds after the substrate binds to um, the enzyme and it can go right there. And so what we have then is we have this here. We have something called the ESI. Kind of sounds like a TV show. Well, that's CSI Miami, right? <laughs> Off topic. But yes, we have this here. So now the substrate binds to the active site. And then the inhibitor binds to the allosteric site. But again, this is after the substrate binds to the enzyme first. So what we have is the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. And in this as well, no product is formed. And the only way for product to form in this is if the inhibitor were to be let loose. All right, guys. So... Those are the three different types of inhibition. We have uncompetitive inhibition. Again, the inhibitor binds to the uh, allosteric site after the substrate binds to the enzyme. First, uncompetitive. Non-competitive, we have an inhibitor that binds to the allosteric site. It does not compete for the active site with the substrate. Then we have the competitive inhibition where the substrate and uh, inhibitor are fighting for that active site, okay? So that concludes this video. In the next video, we'll go more into KM, VMAX, kinetics, and more equations. So uh, I thank you guys for sticking around. If you guys have any questions, leave it down below. Have a wonderful day. Watch all the videos and get those A's. All right, guys, peace.